I'll start recording. So you were suggesting an update or do a round of what people round of update. updates first. Yeah, I can I can go last. I don't know, Mark Anton, if you wanna or I can include the podcast in the updates. I don't know. I actually uh -huh. haven't been working on I can go ahead and start, I guess. I I haven't been working much on Reasonpedia. I, although I don't know where people know where I'm at. I mean, I have a website. Um, I'm using the old Reason Score Math. Um, but what I'm working on right now is some way to visualize how the the numbers are rolling up, because that's the biggest problem is people kind of understanding where the numbers come from. So explaining that's kind of my top priority. But also life is. Um, taking a little bit more time than usual right now. So I haven't been putting a lot of work into it. Actually, right now I'm working on creating a better health tracker for my mom so I can manage her health better. Um, there's nothing really good out there, so I'm writing it myself. Um, that's about what I'm up to. And we can chat about there wasn't There hasn't been much on the podcast, but we, I, can, I can talk about, talk through that in a little bit more detail. Okay, I guess I should go next. Um, I've been a bit busy with uh, the work with Jamie, but it was a bit less. Uh, one of one of the urgent items dropped, so I managed to spend time on other things. Um, but it means I'm exploring GPT three and Elicit and all the AI stuff that is totally different from what I've been doing usually, it, which was more purely symbolic. So that's interesting. I'm still learning a lot. Uh, and, and spacey, and that's more in my comfort zone. Um, I've been spending a lot of time aligning with Daniel Norman still. Uh, we've really achieved a good level of alignment on what's a, how, how do we build, what are our basic concept entities? He's, we don't agree on how to name them, but that's a detail. We've done a lot of mapping of you, what you call this, I call this, and there's a lot of uh, convergence there. So that's highly promising uh, that we'll be able to start writing uh, data models probably fairly soon. Um, I've been... thinking a lot about the next step, which is how to visualize embedded concepts in text, for example. Uh, but that's still a bit hand wavy. Uh, I've done something else that's relevant, trying to remember what. Um, you know, those are have been my main activities. Um, The, I have a conversation to continue with Bin about the cert, about certainty, but that's a detail. Oh yeah, uh, it's not my work, but I totally encourage people to see what uh, fission, the fission people are doing about dialogue, uh, which is, uh, they call it, they, they now call it a postmodern database in a sense that basically each claim this has a cryptographically signed provenance. Um, so each claim has an origin. So this is very much not the canonical route in some way, but I think it's essential in a federated space, personally, in my view of more hyper-knowledge e-view of the world. Uh, so very interesting work there. Um, and that's it, over. Um, I don't really have a, an update, uh, anything update to provide. I mean, the team's still working on the product uh, based on the feedback from my partner from his classroom. Um, I think they're working on um, a way to incorporate uh, contraries into the map. So.
Uh, that, that's always interesting, absolutely. The, the definition of negation makes maps. Yeah. Good. Do you want us to riff on certainty now? Uh, basically, I don't have big objections to what you just wrote. I don't, I wouldn't call this absolute certainty, but practically certain. Sure. <laughs> the, the, because yes, of course, the arguments you made make perfect sense. The whole question of, and this is something worth discussing, I think. Bentley has a reason score, which is kind of a aggregate belief score which is more about parallel reasons. So I guess it's more like parallel arguments because you take, do you take the min or the sum? I'm trying to remember your algorithm. The average. Uh, the average, right. Uh, which I said, you know, works works for parallel reasons, but not for, um, for example, or, or doesn't. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just modeling one of the simplest cases at the beginning. And I said, there's many cases. Mm -hmm. the, the, I'm thinking there's something slightly different. Like I've often spoken about social truth as a kind of what do people believe socially and a kind of sociological analysis. But there's another score, which is kind of the evidence score. Like how well is that evidence backed or how well, how much evidence is there for this claim? How much evidence is there against this claim? And that's a really interesting conversation I think we should have. Yeah, uh, and that's that's kind of where I'm getting at with my scoring system, which, of course, it's only one type of, you know, it's one logical aspect of that. But one way to think about it is evidence. It's just I realize that sometimes people call some things reasons, like we want to do it because of this. And whether that's an evidence or a reason is is kind of the terminology is loose, but in in essence, it is, it's really an evidence. Yeah. The, the um, like, I remember, do, do we want, like, the, the, the problem with evidence in, in a hostile information space is uh, really interesting. Like, for example, Wikipedia has a list of sources it considers comparatively trustworthy. And if you want to add a reference in Wikipedia, you have ideally to quote one of those sources. And it's not enforced, but there's actually a plugin that will color in the references which ones are considered trustworthy source and which ones aren't. Um, very interesting work. The the notion of being, of, of course, it may be too narrow to just say these are the trusted sources, and maybe we'd want to have uh, multiple signals, but I do like the idea of saying, you know, people can, there's a lot of papers whose role is to publish bunk and to, they're not peer reviewed papers, uh, but you can quote these bunk publishing papers as a way to pretend that what you're saying is comes from a scientific journal. Uh, and they're known, they're identified. Uh, so, so being able to have a kind of make that part of the evidence score would be really interesting. Um, but without getting into the truth police thing, it's 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 a very difficult uh, thread. Uh, the, the 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 question is when people offer counter evidence, is there rather than a score a way to say, well, this evidence seems more solid than this counter evidence and things like that, because that's really the interesting case. Of course, sometimes some people don't offer evidence, they just assert things. That's easy enough to detect. And, and again, in the case of reasons, like, as you said, reason is not evidence. How do you know the, how do you identify the difference? I understand this was not in your scope for Gullibut, 
Galibat is explicitly, I'll believe anything you say. And that was fine. It was a good first experiment. I'm still annoyed at the average because if you have independent arguments, you want the max. Uh, if you have uh, interdependent reasons, you want the min. I'm not sure where the uh, average comes in, but the, and that's why the argument claim distinction that bin does, I think, is adding value here. I mean, we've had that in previous models, right? Distinguishing arguments and claims. We've been playing with a lot of models. <laughs> But certainly the argument claim distinction is not foreign okay. to us. Uh, when you use the word claim, do you mean conclusion? Premise or conclusion. Okay. A, a, a belief that something is the case and the argument, if I understand you well, the argument is saying, given these premises, mm -hmm. it makes the conclusion more or less believable. Believing yeah. in yeah. these premises makes okay. believing in that conclusion more or less believable. That's actually been articulated very precisely by, by Jonathan Warden. Uh, he did a presentation here in CDL as a, he calls it a Bayesian definition of what's a claim. And he's saying basically anything that you believe that alters you, your belief into of something else. Uh, sorry, Jonathan or Carl? Might be Carl even. Uh, um, you can check. So I had emerged in a call, so I missed all of that. But I'll try to I find it. Go through it all over again. But I just may ask stupid questions. No, it was Jonathan. Uh. Tuk, 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 tuk. I'll find it. Um, somehow, I think. Golden. No, I'm not finding it. Uh, sorry. Later, we'll be sad about this. Um, but yeah, the, the, and, and of course, the whole the idea that an argument itself can be attacked by a meta argument because it, an argument is also a claim. It's the claim that these premises are relevant should alter the belief in the conclusion in this way. That's a claim, can be contested. And that's why I think it's a hypergraph because. You have arguments about arguments, saying how relevant is that argument, how believable is the argument itself. Like you can believe the claims and disbelieve the argument. And I don't know if your system supports that. I mean, um, so it, it unpacks a little further. Um, so there are propositions. A proposition can be uh, one or the other. It could be a premise or a conclusion. That's what and a, a, yeah, and well, uh, you call conclusion claim, right? Or, or do you call both premises and conclusion claims? Yes, we do. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, so so proposition is the core is the equivalent of what you call claim. Okay, um, and a claim, well. So, so I like to use the word premise uh, and conclusion, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, proposition and claims. Premise and conclusion, you still need to okay. So a premise can be a conclusion uh, that has its own arguments that consists of premises of their own. Um, and so there's a tree structure that kind of flows up. Um, yeah. And, and I, yeah, and I have an agreement that if you have, if an argument, I'm sorry, if a, Conclusion has 
two or more arguments for it, then the strongest argument for it stands. Although I'm not quite sure what happens when you have a combination of arguments for and counter arguments or arguments against. Um, my my uh, reading of that would be max of the pros minus max of the cons. Yeah, I don't have, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what what my partner would say to that. So I, I'm, I'm blank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the the, but but what I'm pointing at is another phenomenon. I may believe, like you say, premise A B C argument for believing D, right? Mm -hmm. And I could say I believe A B C. I disbelieve D because I don't think your argument is valid. I don't think that D follows from ABC. So this is about contesting not the premises, but the argument, which That's, is a okay. different phenomenon. Sure. So, yes. I have, so, so I want to be able to make arguments about arguments. <laughs> yes. And that's why I'm saying arguments are themselves claims. They're themselves uh, what you call positions because they can be believed or disbelieved. Yeah, so so there's, I, I, I do know that, um, that there are two different ways to attack a conclusion. One way is by contraries or, or, or counter arguments. The other way is to attack the premises of an argument that leads to that conclusion. And a third way, and a third way was kind of similar is to attack the, well, actually no, it's different. It's, it's to attack the inference. Exactly, um, that, that's what I'm talking about, attacking the inference. Okay, yeah, so so I know he has the idea of objections and and I know I had, I don't know what a, he and I agree on yet, but I know that I, I try to push the idea that objections are things you use to attack the inferences or it's to attack the, the premise, not not by not by providing uh, counter arguments to the premise, you know, or contraries, but by by saying that the premise, let's say for example, the, the premise lack uh, the, the the epistemic status that is drawn for that premise is wrong. Um, but why? that's another well, case. I mean, that's I, another I mean, case. The only... Here, I, here, I'm supposing yeah. all the premises are valid. It's the inference that's problematic. Sure. Yeah. Then, then that, that should be a straightforward objection um, to yes. the inference or the argument. To, it, to, yeah. the, to the argument. That's that's what I'm saying. It's it's important yeah. to be able to attack the argument without right. attacking the premises because that's a case. Yes. Yeah. 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 Like like you have non sequiturs. That that's a that's an invalid argument. Yeah. Exactly. Non sequiturs definitely are a thing. A very common one, even. <laughs> yeah. In this political yep. climate, especially, <laughs> or or in a in a in a hostile information environment. Yes. Yes, and 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 and, and sometimes it's, you know it's not intentional. It's just because the way they form the premises uh, makes it kind of hard for them to see the uh, disconnect between the two things they're trying to infer together. That's yeah. also possible. I mean, I'm saying DDoS is a thing, but mistakes, you know, Hanlon's razor applies. Sometimes it's incompetence rather than malice. <laughs> yeah. Like, like even with myself, like, like I discovered early on in my own um, mapping of some arguments that I wanted to uh, evaluate, like I would do, a implies B. Um, uh, C implies B, therefore A implies C, which is wrong, right? <laughs> um, so it's 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 strict logic is not instinctive. Yeah, it's a, it's a learned skill, which yeah, is absolutely is. fine. The, the the system is about teaching people. Yes, yes. About logic mistakes. And, and 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 more important I, even than that, I think helping people to reason together, because I I profoundly believe uh, cognition is a social process. 
primarily. And we, the, the fact that we can do individual cognition is an epiphenomenon. Um, and, and the most important cognitive processes are social. Although we do it by... <laughs> by emulating the other person's mind. So it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Even but that's we're on our own, right? And, and sometimes we emulate ourselves in our mind and have conversations with ourselves. Yes. Yeah. And I'm it's saying social. that's slightly an epiphenomenon. I mean, we, we have theory of mind for social cognition first, and then we use it for solitary cognition. And solitary cognition is known to be extremely prone to uh, a lot of bias uh, that actually there are conditions where social cognition also fails spectacular, spectacular, blah, spectacularly, but uh, there are conditions where social cognition is much more, much better than individual cognition ever is. And that's the point in the argument of reason. By the way, I'm referring a specific book here that really helped me. Like I've always had this at an intuitive level, but there's a book that makes makes it very formal. It's called uh, The Enigma of Reason. And I absolutely recommend that book to understand cognition as a social phenomenon and, and, and cognitive and collective intelligence. Brilliant book. Um, I've recommended it before, but since. Uh, Sperber and uh, what's his name? Um, anyway. Sperber is the second author on this. Um, should be easy to find which with the title. So yeah, the, the goal is to, for me, the key goal is to enable better upscale and better skills at successful collect, collective intelligence. Uh, given that collective intelligence can fail spectacularly, but can succeed spectacularly as well. Okay, so yeah, collective evidence. Um, do we want to get into sources or and, and provenance for an ev evidence score? Or how much can we do without that? Again, positing a hostile environment and disinformation. Since you were talking about disinformation a lot recently, maybe it's worth getting into the points you got into during the podcast. Um, yeah, so kind of just in general to give people an idea on what, what we're doing in the podcast space, we have a podcast channel and it's a place where I keep thinking I want to do a podcast to work in public on reason score. Um, we also have Steve Yana, who's a, a professor from New York, a, uh, rhetorical professor, um, and he has in the bin, which is an uh, interesting podcast. I think not a great name. Uh, and uh, so, and then we talked through um, Tim's article on disinformation, um, which is pretty much you know kind of going over the highlights of it, and then, um, uh, and then Steve kind of. So it was mostly just kind of a chat about that article, not able to get really deep because it's, you know, multiple articles that Tim wrote um, that was on um, epistemic security, kind of like national security, but and how we make decisions. So that was interesting. Uh, Steve basically gives us all kind of a carte blanche to come on his podcast anytime. He's recording at least once a week, sometimes twice. It's just a casual podcast. It's not directly actionable or meant to be well, it's not a highly produced podcast. It's more one of the conversations ones. He does have a fair amount of listeners because uh, he was not not a bunch, but just like, you know, 100 people show up sometimes and sometimes 20 uh, when he's doing a live. Uh, and then people listen afterwards. I don't know what his total listenership is, um, but he's worked on, he did um, college level and high school debate competitions. So there's a lot of people that have him in their podcast reader from that. Um, and then he has several other professors that he brings on and they discuss kind of teaching rhetoric. Um, and then I, in the podcast channel, I put a lot of suggested names cause I'm still trying to, I'm playing. It's more of a hobby to think of um, a good branding for some place where we can 
experiment with our, you know, canonical debate lab stuff and reasons score to be a part of it. Um, where we could kind of like give examples of using these tools in real world or fictional scenarios. Um, so that's kind of the way I think of it. And then, yeah, we, I think we were talking about how to trust your sources and stuff. Although when I think about reason score and reason PDA, it's, it's, there's never a trust a source. It's like, here's the source, but it's open to debate. Um, or whether that, what that source is, whether they, apply to this specific claim and how much and and hopefully what is the evidence that the source has like if it's a paper <laughs> the paper has evidence in it so let's dig down into the paper and people can debate each individual you know how the study was done and what data was collected um, all that stuff so a source to me is is never really an end it's just a it's just another another form of claim It's funny when I was talking to someone about Reasonpedia and she goes, well, what if I don't agree with your sources? And I'm like, well, we don't agree with our sources. <laughs> the world is our source and we disbelieve it all. Well, it's all open to debate. It's really a better way to say it. The canonical debate lab slogan, everything's debatable. <laughs> There's no bottom. Oh, you're muted, Mark Anton. Just curious, Bin, have you read Tim's article on disinformation? Are you aware of it? Um, no, I, I don't think I've, I've read it, so I can't um, provide input on that. Uh, I do have a thought about the idea, you know, what happens if you don't agree on the sources, but um, not, not about the content of the article itself. Uh, let me put a link to it. And yes, I'm curious to hear you. You have a you have a link, and I put I found uh, Jonathan's work on Bayesian reasoning. There's many articles, but this is an entry point. The link I posted above. So. Go ahead, or, or or should I go into, should we go quickly into the hybrid warfare aspect? The... Well, what I'd say within the, within the scope of the article first, like with the hybrid warfare, and then we can talk about the more fundamental question about trusting sources afterwards, but that kind of makes sense from a small standpoint. Um... Bentley, would you want to go into the article? You were into it more recently than I was. I um, I kind of let Tim do most of the talking on that. I was just more like Steve Yano answering it. Um, I mean, it's it's a broad case of all the here's, and it's very similar to our our documents. Uh, our um, you know, these are all the problems with the current information state, and then you know, Canonical Debate Lab can improve the situation. Yeah, it, it goes really the summary. It goes into the the specific problems such as tribalism and how canonical debate is about having one place where all the pros and cons are put together, and um, also the canonical debate position. That's that's one part I'm a bit uneasy about, but it's it makes sense. It detaches arguments from provenance. So it doesn't go into sources. It, it, in a way, clears the sources because the idea is to have the pros and cons stand on their own uh, and to have I, the, yeah. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that it does that at all level. So like if you're, if you're making a claim that this is true, the climate, you know, the temperature, the planetoid temperature is, you know, two points above normal or something points of Celsius above normal. That claim doesn't have necessarily have the source like who said it if some prominent politician said it. But if you're saying it's true because of this scientific paper, then the scientific paper is a source. Um, so I guess sources are optional when they add value. 
but we, we don't, if the person that said it isn't a, an expert, then it's kind of like, well, we don't really care who said it in that case. Um, so there's, there's not prominence on the, on the claims unless, but there are sources to claims if the claim is that a source said it and that it's true. Right. Fair enough. The, the, which I guess is more of a source than pro provenance, basically. The, the, the idea was to depersonalize and to remove the cult of personality uh, aspect from yeah. the... Um... Yeah, if the debate's like, yeah, if Joe Rogan happened to say it, we probably wouldn't quote Joe Rogan unless the debate is about whether Joe Rogan is causing issues with what he says, and then we would say Joe Rogan said this or had this person on his thing. Then there would be a... And then you'd point to that episode, right? So, right. But in so, general, yeah, we don't want to, it's not like this politician said, it's not PolitiFact or Snopes in that way. So, so or, yeah, it's about detribalizing the debate dynamics. So, so good distinction about sources versus people. Uh, sources are important, though all sources have people behind them and for conspiracy theorists it's sources are also tri tribal affiliation right yeah so but still it's 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 a step it does do something to depersonalize so ben do you I, I i'm for the record i think we need a layer with full provenance and people and when i speak about social truth it's very much about knowing who said what which is very different consideration uh I think provenance is vital to analyze um, trustworthiness, but it's a different concern. Maybe I don't. Uh, Bin, where what do you have to say about sources? Um. So the, the, the another way of looking at sources is looking at credibility of the sources, right? And you know, you, you mentioned the word tribalism. And what's tribalism? Tribalism is basically about granting credibility to a source, not based on, uh, not based on, let's say, some sort of historical trail of whether that source has been reliable or not, um, but based on the fact that that source agrees with you on something else. So, I think, <clears throat> I think this is where a tool where you can actually have a discussion so you know via objections or via some sort of mechanism where you can disagree so this is not a, a disagreement on the inference but this is a disagreement on the epistemic status of a that is assigned to a claim right so this is a claim this claim came from either fox news or cnn and okay so so actually i need to actually backtrack a little bit so this is where i i don't so I don't understand enough to say I disagree with the position that uh, reasoning is, is social or that um, there's some sort of collective, uh, collective thinking. Um, I would argue that uh, thinking is individual. We can share clues to each other, clues with one another, and then it, it, with the goal of helping one another we get more clarity, but all thinking is internal. So what I mean by this is, let's say, <clears throat> Uh, let's say there's an argument in front of in front of both of us, and we both agree that uh, the the inference is valid. So there's two premises: inference to a conclusion. The inference is valid. We agree on that, and we agree that premise A is is correct. Um, but premise B came from let's say a news source to which we would assign different epistemic statuses to that news source. Uh, or, or different credibility value to that. Yeah, to that different resource. values of trust, yeah. Yeah. So I think at that point, we can have a, a conversation and kind of figure out, is the reason why I'm assigning uh, a higher level of trust to that news source is because of some sort of, um, I, I guess, uh, cognitive non-secular, you know, oh, uh, this news source, you know, they agree with my position, therefore it's a reliable position, so that was, that's a tribalistic uh method of thinking or is it because um historically 
I, you know, what they've reported has been accurate, and I don't have evidence to, to, um, say that they have been inaccurate in the past. So I, I believe it because benefit of a doubt, right? That's 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 the principle I'm operating from. Um, but even then, my my view on on trusting sources, I think, is you know, I would not, I would not say that just because a source and even if it's an expert i would not automatically like let's say i go to the use of cancer for example i go to the doctor doctor say i have a cancer i would not automatically say it's certain i don't know if i even say it's probably true like he would have to show me um x-rays he would actually show me things that independent of the words that comes out of his mouth uh for me to assign that a high uh, epistemic status so i think part of the issue is you know people trusting um, sources without not lots of people trusting sources that might be might, might might have been proven wrong in the past, but also them granting too high, just granting that source too high of an epistemic status out of the gate. Like Fox News says this, it's true, or CNN says this, therefore it's true. It's like, I mean, that's just what they said, right? Did they give you evidence? Did they give you quote? Or did are 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 you accepting the conclusion as being true and then, you know, forget everything else? But, you know, that conclusion now becomes like de facto truth. So, um, the, and yeah. Go on. Sorry. No, that's all. That's all. Okay. No, no. Uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, totally agree. Uh, the evidence is important. On the other hand, let's take the doctor example. It's a good one. Doctor shows me an x ray and says, you know, this looks like a tumor. Can I read an X-ray? No, it's it's uh, the ability to read an X-ray is an acquired skill that takes time to acquire, and that you acquire in not only through the medical training but through the accumulated experience, which is very much social knowledge that gets transmitted through the teaching. That hey. This blotch on the X-ray looks like it looks normal versus this other blotch looks like a tumor, and that's something that you imbibe. It's not that there's a clear, you know, this size, this thing. This maybe there is, but like in many cases, reading is a socially acquired skill, uh, and so all I have is trust that a the body of uh, doctors as a whole can actually interpret x-rays somewhat reliably. And B, the, my particular doctor is representative of the body of doctors as a whole. And, 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 and here I'm totally doing Bayesian inference. But I agree that's it, that uh, I've been a big fan of the work of Tetlock on super forecasting. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, he's been looking at the track record of pundits at forecasting political events. In general, it's dismal. Uh, but he says there are people who are better at forecasting than others. And there are specific circumstances that make it more likely that someone will do a halfway decent job of forecasting. But, and, and, and there's many conditions, but what he's saying is it can be measured the quality of forecasts like and it's it's a bit it's non trivial to measure it because if somebody makes you know this will happen forecasts well they'll be wrong more often than not uh, but if they say well you know this is 60% chance of happening it's harder to evaluate but that luck worked a lot on statistical methods to say this 60% is better than chance than somebody's saying, and you, like somebody else says 40%, this person says 60%. Well, this person 60% is indeed right, 60% on average, uh, as opposed to somebody else claiming 40%, whatever. Uh, it, so he has methods for measuring forecasting capability. And then what he does is he gets good forecasters to be aware of one another's scores and the good forecasters who exchange heuristics and they improve. And so he has, again, a social process for people becoming better forecasters. But what's also important is he has a mechanism to 
evaluate the trustworthiness of those forecasters. Now, forecasting is one case, but the measurable, visible track record of people's assertions, I think, is an extremely interesting way to look at source trustworthiness. Like so many pundits are consistently wrong on everything they predict, right? Um, and it should show on their score. <laughs> Um, okay, so 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 he has come up with uh, I'll just paraphrase it um, with a methodology where he uses historical accuracy to as a way to evaluate the credibility. Um, okay, yeah, I mean that's 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 fine. It's like if if let's say you have a friend who has historically been inaccurate about his assessment of things, and you don't trust that friend very much. Um, going, going, going back, going back to the doctor thing. Um, so it's true that doctors spend I don't know six years or so learning a lot of stuff. Um, I, I do think though <clears throat> that part of it is because they're learning about a lot of different stuff that are not specifically related to cancer. So what that means is that within the context of the subject that I, let's say the patient, who actually care about, I do have the ability to spend a lot of time, or spend a reasonable amount of time, not not the same amount of time the doctor did, to come to learn to how to, let's say, read x-rays um, or understand the, the chemical uh, method by which they use, you know, let's say when they do a biopsy to detect whether something is can cancerous or not. Uh, because, you know, my, my, my interest at that point as a patient is very narrow. I'm not learning about tuberculosis or you know, 20 other things that he has to learn about. Um, it's much more narrow. So I think people who are cancer patients generally tend to be a lot more knowledgeable about cancer than Fair people enough. who've never had cancer. Um, just, just as part of their desire to like really know a whole lot about this thing. Um, and not just rely on experts. Um, but, but what I'm saying is, okay, that's one example, but in general, we have to rely on thousands of experts with each of them a lot of specific knowledge, and there's nobody can learn all the relevant expertise in a single lifetime. Trust is essential. Uh, you cannot... I mean, you can choose to trust nobody and to live in disbelief of everybody. And that's sure, that's a route. But uh, what I'm saying, if you want to function, <laughs> you have to trust things that you won't have the time to verify. That's just how it is. <laughs> if you want to function being a premise, of course. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't disagree with that statement. I, I think it just kind of comes down to the severity, right? So, so like I, I bought this for for breakfast, right? This, uh, yep. I mean, I, I'm not. You I'm trust not that nobody poisoned it on route, yeah? And you trust that yeah, there yeah. was enough yeah, and, health safety inspections that it's not contaminated. Then you trust, like, how but, many people but, do we trust? <laughs> but yeah, I do. Uh, but I also do rely on, you know, like, and I'm, I'm sure you do too, like uh, some uh, basic check, like the smell test, right? Like if you pick up, uh, you know, leftover, you're like, you know, so, so, so you don't, you know, you don't. They're like, heuristics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and yeah, well, um, and you know, this is not cancer, right? This, this is not like me saying, okay, do I, do, am I going to take chemotherapy where it costs severe damage to my body or not? So it's, it's not the same thing. So. So I think, uh, I mean, we're, I think we're on the same page. Critical thinking is important. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I was not trying to say don't do critical thinking. I mean, the, the whole point in the uh, Enigma of Reason is we have to, in, in a group, we can't all check all options. So it makes sense to distribute the work of checking different options in the group and then 
reason to like argue it out who has the best arguments and who has the best arguments both for their own what they checked and against what we checked and uh and then it's a trust but verify right you build a mental model of who's trustworthy you you it works in a group where there's an assumption of vaguely common goals like if you have the trust but verify thing doesn't work if you see half of the population as an adversary um but if you have belief in 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 vague common goals then you can have this trust but verify and and most of the time it will be minimal heuristic for trust because we don't have time to go in depth verifying everything so we use pragmatic heuristics to say okay i'll trust this thing and i totally believe having it all all laid out in a canonical debate database is a way to allow people to verify more and that's brilliant and 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 being made aware of this has already been refuted <laughs> we can stop worrying about that option because it's been convincingly refuted not absolutely i i, I say but convincingly uh yeah um Oh, uh, I just people with a track record. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just pop in with the theory. So, or uh, a summary, um, you know, verifying and thinking critically is, is a cognitive load. We're constantly making a decision of, or not even intuiting. Do I need to spend more time to increase the accuracy of this estimate? Um, and the canonical debate lab's goal is to reduce the cognitive load so that people can make better decisions is kind percent. of the way I see it. I'm kind of wondering, I, I mean, I kind of feel like the ultimate for all that we're doing is talking about group decision making and specifically the, you know, it's not all of group decision making. There's a, there's a lot of that space that we're not working on, but it seems like to me that's the ultimate goal. And I think one of the discussions and the, the hangouts was supposed to be you know aligning on goals, but I don't know if people agree with that or disagree with that. Good point. We had left that a bit. The, the aligning on goals. There's I consider we barely have quorum here. I really resent uh, how few of us there is. Thank you for you two being there. Uh, but goal alignment, if people are not there, is a bit futile. Um, I mean, that's true. Uh, but, you know, you could shoot it down if, if I'm wrong. But but I agree totally that uh, what you about with what you just said, like helping reduce the cognitive load of verification is, I see as totally a key goal uh, because cognitive... Uh, Collective decision requires being able to verify easily what other people are saying, but also this whole trust but verify, building up the trust by creating track records is something I see as a goal in what I'm building. I'm not sure that's part of, of CDL because CDL wants to depersonalize the arguments. On the other hand, we could recast that as track records, not of people, but of heuristics. Because, and I think this is extremely important. Heuristics are not 100% accurate, but they're ways to decide, is this worth getting down this rabbit hole to check this particular fact? And heuristic track records is something we'd probably like to know. Because there's very few pure deductive arguments in real life. Most arguments are Bayesian, probabilistic, likelihood, preponderance of evidence, and some heuristical reasoning and thinking, yeah, this is good enough. I, like the deductive is the exception. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me take a step back real quick. I, I'd like to just validate with you guys on and probably need to do it with the rest of the group. But when I do kind of the why, the five whys, and it's like we talk about, oh, reducing cognitive load. Well, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to do that? It seems to me that the top one is making better group decisions. I mean, that is that is where the rubber meets the road. And even though I'm no longer promoting that on reason score because it's too far down in the stack, 
<laughs> for me to claim that it does that anyway no, I, I agree that, totally like that's the that. top one and then we have goals underneath there which is you know um tracking and maintaining people's quality of of reasoning and um creating a database of claims and creating a yeah, scoring yeah, yeah, system yeah. I, agree, people... I agree Be okay. better collective decision a and it's action <laughs> yeah yeah i guess that's yeah that's that's <laughs> It's actually collective action, isn't it? Because who cares if we make a decision if we don't actually do anything? The, so it's really the, collective. It, it's the OODA loop. I mean, we mentioned the OODA loop uh, recently in another call, or and I think it's actually in the warfare uh, thing. Uh, it's a better OODA loop. It's the whole action. Like, like I said often, sense-making, collective sensing, collective sense-making, collective ideation, collective decision, collective action, and then from action back to sensing and having a loop. Yeah. Of... And yeah, individual. I... I mean, you, you get a better collective I cycle if also people do it better individually. But I think the... I focus more on having a good collective cycle because yes, for me, that's where the rubber hits the road. If we can achieve that with changes to the collective process that don't require everybody to think correctly, because I think that's a very tall order. But of course, the more we can improve individual cognition, the better it is. But I'm more interested in, in improving the process of uh, assembling flawed collective cognition into better uh, collective cognition because i think there's more uh it's a lower hanging fruit than expecting everybody to have correct individual cognition and i actually don't even believe that without a good collective process correct individual reasoners will arrive at a good collective result i think a good collective process is a necessary condition much more necessary than good individual cognition, though good individual cognition helps a lot and is worth achieving in its own right. Absolutely. And if there's too much misalignment between collective and individual cognition, then people will feel not listened to in revolt and that will throw out the collective process. So that's not good either. So you do need both. But I do think that individual cognition, good good individual cognition without a good aggregation process might not be enough. So I'm really interested in the aggregation process. So Ben, I don't know if that, if you kind of agree with all that that we're saying or if that sounds off track or. Um, so it's different. Um, then my angle, my angle is the priority of being, <clears throat> of, of being clear yourself. Um, if you can cooperate with somebody else, obviously it's better than, you know, you can probably do a lot more, but it's not a requirement for success. Um, because you can always go your own way, which, which, you know, if I were to apply it here, um, it's the same thing, right? Like, like I can still cooperate and work on, let's say, like a common format to exchange data between our system without having to agree with the purpose being collective decisioning. You know, I, I can re I can still retain my purpose, which is to create a tool to help the person using that tool, you know, overcome things like cognitive load and whatnot. Um, and if there's a side benefit where they can use that communication tool with other people, um, then that's great. But the main purpose is still them overcoming, uh, overcoming cognitive cognitive limitations due to the fact that our consciousness can only be aware of seven plus or minus two things at any given time. That makes it difficult for us to think about complex ideas. Um, you know, that, that to me is the most important thing. And then if I apply the five why, you know, why is it important for me to overcome cognitive load as well? Uh, the, the, the reason is simple. Uh, reason is my means of survival. And finding ways to improve, to, to make the means of survival more effective for my life, um, you know, <laughs> if my life is the most valuable thing to me on the planet, then uh, that should be my reason. 
So. Yeah, so the only kind of thought about that is that a lot of the actions we have to take to make our own life successful depends now on our ability to convince other people. I mean, so yeah. it depends on what you believe about climate change, but, you know, we can't work together on that. We're all going to die. So, or maybe not us, but our children. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's... Uh, the, the self-survival is kind of, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's just kind of my thought when I do it. But, but yeah, to, to say that you want to, as your top goal to increase in individuals is not counter, you know, it doesn't limit anything. And that's a perfectly fine opinion um, and goal, main goal. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I... I agree we probably don't need to align on that because certainly the goals are quote unquote confluent in the sense that increasing individual cognition makes for better collective cognition. And increasing collective cognition also, I mean, if we have better collective cognition, A, more chance of survival, I agree with that, but B, uh, a better collective knowledge with which to hone, to use as better premises for individual cognition. So these goals are confluent anyway. Although, so I don't, yeah, what, one I don't, thought on that, though, is that when I try and look in, so I'm eating the keto diet, and one concern is that it's heart disease. There's a lot of debate about that. When I try and go in and actually categorize all the data, I get exceedingly bored and frustrated. So I'm hiring someone to do that. Um, so there there are things in my life where I need to make a decision and I don't want to do it all by myself. Uh, so that's also kind of another thought on that. Um, that the ability to offload that work is... Um, is Using... Uh, is important to me. Not important as a as a no 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 but the, the 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 question is that's the agency problem right mm -hmm. uh, how much do you trust an individual person or an a collective to think properly on your behalf when they may have their own goals that may not align with yours well, I guess the next step on goal alignment I was thinking so if it's collective action or better individual. I don't know, Ben, if you'd also agree with individual action is okay because there's not much point in thinking clearly if you're not actually taking action or choosing not to take action. I don't know yeah, if, you're, I mean, if you'd I, object to that wording or... No, no. Uh, it's it, The entire purpose of thinking is to um, identify the values to pursue uh, and you mm -hmm. have to act for, you know, and create a plan on how you're going to pursue that and you're going to ultimately act to acquire that value. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's all about the action of the individual, um, which is what you think. Yeah. So um, my next thought on as far as, and we're going to have to align with everyone else, so we'll have to see what they think about these. But it, when you talk about either collective action or individual, better individual actions, there's a lot of ways to hit that. And we're not kind of hitting them all. Like you could train someone on better heuristics. Uh, you can give, you can create a training document on on how to, you know, you could write a self help book, right? But we're solving, we're improving action taking, either in individual or groups. And I guess I don't know what that next sentence is. <laughs> is like through argument maps is what comes to mind, but that doesn't sound quite right. But you know what, it's, um, that's kind of, I think, the next step. So like the top line or a thing is better actions for CDL would be collectively and for Ben, it might be for individuals. And then through, you know, because we're not, we're not doing that whole space. We're taking off a bite. The... Maybe I have a I'll have a hard limit uh, 
pretty soon yeah, today. We've done gone an hour, so we can stop at any time. Uh, maybe we should revisit the document where we went into scope and goals. Uh, I find it. Um, there's many, of course. Yeah. CI feature and goal, CDL work packages. I've done, I spent a lot of time writing things about the, our shared goals. Yes, here's, it's that one. Um, and I think it's important to revisit that. What we had identified as first action, like subcommittees, uh, and we said we'd spend time on, yes, exactly. We'd spend time on making sure we align on goals. And this is where, God, I wish we were all here. Uh, there's a list of tools work, which I basically dropped. Uh, I know that the, OG, uh, the OGM people are working on this and I've decided, okay, whatever. I've handed them what I've done. Um, there's the domain the layers and I spend a lot of time on kind of what I see as the base domain, uh, which is different. Uh, but we're still, let's say that I haven't managed to coordinate well enough with Stephen, but it's still something I think is very valuable. There's the work on, on social protocol is evolving on its own. Uh, that's Felix and uh jeremy are working on that not jeremy sorry uh jonathan are working on that and it's progressing a pace i did hang out with them for a while and i decided they're they're fine <laughs> i don't need to be there um and and for me a lot depends like we said modeling at the layer boundaries as after we've done the layer distinctions and then breaking down the layers into components. Here, when we speak of layers, uh, we're still trying to define them, but I'm very interested in a kind of very basic layer of what is concept identity? When are two concepts the same, related, not the same? That's something that interests me a lot. And then above that, there's the whole claim ontology that we have, that you seem to, your uh, bin is mostly working at that layer, which is saying, you know, we have claims or propositions connected by um, arguments. So that's the claim ontology layer, if you will. But for me, it has to be built on a claim identity, a uh, concept identity layer. Uh, and then there's an, the social layers are kind of above that. Like who says what and how do we uh, aggregate things and how does that interact with reputation and how does that interact with uh, quality of evidence and how can we speak about quality of evidence and so on and so on. And there's the whole, um, when we speak of canonical debate lab, there is a notion that canonicality of claims means that we can talk about claims and say that this claim here is the same as that one. So we can talk about the canonical version and all the, if I make a counter argument to this claim, well, if this claim is the same as that one, it also applies to that claim. And here's why the identity is so important. And there's the kind of, I don't know if that's a layer, but the, uh, data format protocol, whatever, that enables us to look at claims in many different tools and say, well, these are related in some specific fashion that allows us to talk across tools and make statements that traverse tools. And either in a centralized or federated manner, we're still debating that. Uh, there's all these other things we need to do, revisit the website and so on and so forth and so forth. But the work on the layers I still see as relevant so that we can speak about how we discuss across those layers. I'm still spending a lot of time working on the 
concept identity layer. That's work I'm doing with Danielle Norman, who's not officially a CDL person. Uh, Bentley is working a lot on the scoring aspect. Uh, Tim is very interested in canon quality, but as I said, he's not here these days. Stephen, yeah, Stephen is still working on, by the way, you should, uh, Ben, I don't know if you've looked at debate map. Debate map is something that Stephen has, is still building. Uh, it's a very good system for writing argument map, like it already exists. And uh, so the way it works is you have pros and cons and you have relevance arguments. So it allows a uh, separate relevance argument. It's It doesn't materialize arguments quite the way you're doing, but because the way the claims are connected is pretty specific. You can do it in debate map. And you have belief propagation uh, in debate map. Like this is, you know, so many people believe in this at a certain level and it's average within that. And I'm not sure how the propagation is done, but there is such a thing as propagation. Um, and, and, Jamie Joyce of Society Library has been using the bait map to make these amazingly rich and complete uh, maps of different arguments, social, popular social arguments. There's been one about COVID. There's been one about climate change. There's been one, like right now we have the COVID combo. The problem is there's technical depth. So we have the COVID combo header on all the maps right now. And this is the climate change <laughs> map. Um, yeah. that's a, pr a problem, but anyway, uh, I've been working on, uh, connecting this to some AI stuff, uh, not directly in debate map, but in parallel tools that talk to debate map because debate map has a good API. Um, I don't know if debate map already does a lot of what you want. It's possible or not. It's not something you can build a business on because it's open source. I mean, you can build a usage business on, of course. Um, training and everything. But I don't know if you need a new tool is what I'm saying, because this is a pretty good tool. It, uh, it, it looks like it's just pros and cons, right? It's pros and cons, but you can add relevance arguments at any step. Uh, what, what is a relevant argument? What does that mean? It means not attacking the pro and con, but attacking why is that argument relevant? Oh, okay. I, I, I guess what I mean by pros and cons is... Um, and there's some like, question, and, and there's pros and like, cons here <clears throat> because we're at the position level, but you can start with adding, you can add questions if I remember well. Yeah, so, so 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 my issue with uh, with with maps <clears throat> that just lists pros and cons is there, there isn't an actual inference there. Like 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 I want to get to the point where you can actually identify the type of inference that you're using um, for a specific argument. Um, Fair and, enough. And yeah, and you need to do that. If you want to validate the, the inference, right? Um, you can't validate the inference if it's just a list of pros and cons. I agree with you, actually. Uh, but it's very easy to make the argument into a pro node and then have the premises of the arguments into pros of the arguments. And because you have relevance, you can say, well, this are, it's not perfect, but it's perfectly doable. Plus, I think this could be a suggestion to make to Venrix. The debate map is... does have a, have a type that has premises. He has like, several different claim types. So I don't know if and this, it, it, this map may not have any in them. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it, the tool is more, uh, is more elaborate than is immediately apparent. There's a lot of depth to that tool. I think there's a UX problem that so much of it is hidden, uh, but there's multiple phrasing, there's, uh, reference to external sources of evidence. There's a lot of tooling that is there. 
it's not, um, there's a lot of work in that tool for what it's worth. Um, yeah, and I don't, um, you know, y'all were talking about inferences and I mean, I haven't, I haven't handled all the different debate types. Um, I guess I'm questioning that as part of my exploration i guess i guess it will end up being true i i just don't know at what point you actually need that for most decision making like give me an example of what you mean by inference because i well the, for example the difference between deduction and induction and abduction uh, it's relevant when you're attacking because the angles of attack are not the same. Uh, abduction is very heuristical, and that means you need to do more fact-checking. Uh, I pointed out the, um, the argumentation schemes, the Walton argumentation schemes, because they list the angles of attack for each reasoning. And and being having access to that is invaluable when you're oh. actually yeah. And I, the problem is also induction, abduction, deduction. I don't like. I keep looking up those definitions, and then they kind of like fly off in my brain. Um, uh, the the so I mean, can you give a a specific example? Sure, 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 sure. Well, see, deduction is from general rule to specific instance, right? Uh, you know, I'll, 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 the, the classic Socrates example is a deduction. So uh, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Hence, what? Socrates is mortal. Okay, but that the, the, that the, is that is the. I would like to have a a useful example rather than that one because that is there's so many things wrong with that argument. <laughs> it's it's it's. It's classical, and it, for me, when I look at all this stuff, it is probably the worst I, way I, I to talk about something. In, I agree totally. In conversation. You know, I, I said earlier in the conversation, uh, the deduction is the least common case in real life. It happens. I mean, I do. I use it yeah. a lot in mathematics, but outside mathematics, not so yeah. much. But there's. There's cases where mathematics applies to real life, and then deduction is wonderful. Um, right. The, the, yeah. But, you're doing math. Yeah. Well, no, I, but sometimes I apply math to physical reality. It happens, right? You're yes. calculating uh, the. That's how we know we knew that the size of the Earth, or that's why was it there Eratosthenes or one of the Greek philosophers that used the side of the of the Earth by applying uh, hypotenuse, and that was mm -hmm. applying mathematics to the real world. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, induction. Quick, quick sorry, I'll, I'll continue uh, with the man because it's classic. I have a quick, quick comment. Um, you, you said you had a hard stop. You, how, how about the next meeting be about deduction, induction, and abduction? I think that's a order. brilliant idea. I, just as long as I'm the only person I think that that might, unless other people find it interesting. Because I, 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 I find it interesting because, frankly speaking, it wasn't until I started working my, on this project that I started getting more clarity on it. So you, you're not unique. Okay. And yeah, we can we can talk about that or or what other if other people show up, then whatever agenda is yeah. there. I'm not sure what level of participation we'll get at this time. People said they're available, but but um, they're not. The, 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 just, just as a closing comment, generally the types we mostly most reasonings are heuristical, are heuristics. There's very little certain reasoning in the real world. Huh. And, and and identifying different heuristics and their relative reliability in different circumstances is absolutely crucial. And another sociological observation is that different groups think of different heuristics as more or less reliable, different yeah. tribes. And, and, and so knowing, oh, it's this kind of reasoning. And so this will be 
thought likely by some people and not by others. That's interesting in terms of maybe we can look at the heuristic itself. Yeah, I I balk at that. I don't know if I can explain it yet. I, I kind of think heuristics are byproduct, but then when I do the reason score math, it's it's all based on um it's shared heur heuristics really is what it is. And it's like if my heuristic comes up with a different value than your heuristic, then let's talk about not so much the heuristics themselves, but our intuitions on why the heuristic is coming out at a different thing, which is, as you know, completely different from actually why you're making that decision. But I, so I, I want to recognize, use the heuristics as information and then sidestep them in the math so that they are no longer used in the decision-making process, but they informed the decision-making process. But, well, they're not, they're not reified in the decision-making process. They are still used because any time that you haven't gone in and said, well, why do, why do we think the heuristic came out with this? If we're disagreeing on this on the results of this. You're heuristic. talking about the heuristic in your system. I'm talking about the heuristics. No, I'm in... saying the heuristics in pe people's mind. Okay. So they they say, "Oh, I hear this piece of evidence. I don't I don't believe that." And the other person, so no, I believe that. If they both believe it, and then I don't uh, I don't want the system to go any further down. There's no point. We could. It's an endless loop. But if, if they both agree on, you know, this is accurate, then the, 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 what I'm the saying is. Will... Evaluating evidence is a heuristic. We are saying, oh, this is enough evidence for me. And that's a heuristic. Okay, well, we're saying collectively, if everyone says it's enough evidence for them. Yeah, then, that's good enough. Yes, I agree. We, yeah, we, yeah. But for possibly, uh, I mean, science is about digging deeper sometimes. But yeah, agree, yeah. Not all the time. Yeah. Not all the time. Yeah. So good I enough. I mean, you can always go purpose. deeper. It's, the it's, system it's, won't enough, stop you. It's enough for a given purpose. And that's yeah, a heuristic. Right. That's exactly yeah. what a heuristic is. Right. It's saying this is enough evidence for me for this purpose. Right. And, and, but, and right. What, what what I'm saying is different people will differ in what they consider enough evidence because they have different heuristics. Right. Or they'll say this doesn't qualify as evidence for me because I don't think that this qualifies as evidence. And there's also a heuristic there. Like this could be heuristically contributory evidence or not. And that's the heuristics I was talking about. And, 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 and most evidence is heuristically relevant. Not all, but most. Saying this, this premise is relevant to that conclusion, there's usually a heuristic at play. It's usually relevant to that conclusion. Yeah, I, I think it's all heuristics everywhere, but when you're putting it in the system, you're forcing, or my goal in reason score is to force them to step out of the heuristic and put a logical reason why they think, we know that there's no connection between heuristics and logic, but force them out of the heuristic into the, the logical and put your reasons why and be explicit. And if you can't, if you're, if you can't figure out a reason why your heuristic is that way, then to add, uh, you know, no one's going to believe you until you figure out why. So then the heuristics are then eliminated as there's disagreements. And then there's no heuristics in the actual math itself. Um, in theory. Well, we probably need to shut down. We can continue that discussion. But yeah, it'd be interesting to talk more abduction deduction because right now i think i don't know which of those you keep telling me i i have in, in my naive model um uh and maybe we could talk about the difference between um deontic and uh epistemic as well mm -hmm. um but we can yep. we can do that next time i don't know that i actually want to put too much cognitive work in that because i still want to get this simple model kind of working well that, that, that's a maybe that's a separate i mean i think that's a sub goal like I, we spent a lot of time today discussing this partly because we were uh 
like Bin is new here, so we're revisiting a lot of stuff, and that's yeah. good. Uh, I think that's valuable. Um, the but you're right. This discussion should be about goal alignment, and we should like if we want to go into reason score. And I think it's a good conversation to have. We should make that into a separate call and then yeah. invite people to the reason score conversation. And I'm all for it. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. But yeah, using this meeting for goal alignment um, would probably be a good use next week. That requires people to be there. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I thought I had on mute already. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I understand. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.